Can everyone hear me okay? Raise your hand if you cannot hear me. Oh. Okay. Can everyone hear me again? So, this is so annoying. I'm, I have one. I just like to talk with my hands a lot. So, forcefully, like with gusto. It doesn't want to stay. It, it will make a loud noise every time I touch it, so. Want to try this way? Are you okay with that? I'm good with that. Okay. It's the way we have to be, since my ear is not adhering to lavalier standards. So I'm assuming if you're in this room, it's intentional and you've all made a terrible decision to attend this talk, 3D Printing and Other Dark Arts, by me, Karen Rucker. Um, real quick, just to get a feel of the audience, who in here has a ham radio license? Okay, all the front row people, gold star. How many people have any knowledge of radio or antennas? Okay, who came in just because they thought the title was weird and they had nothing better to do? Thank you, you're the people that I'm here for. So I struggled with who to create this talk for. I knew that it would be a varied audience. I wasn't that familiar with this community. So I tried to create it to answer a lot of the RF and antenna questions that I get from mostly aerospace engineering students. That might sound kind of weird, but I have been semi-moderately popular on Twitter, so random students that don't have an introduction to that will get really panicky about the RF and antenna requirements of different projects, so they'll reach out to me. So some of this, for hams, it might be a little low for you. Other people, maybe too much. I'll try to hit somewhere in the middle. Feel free to ask questions. Hams, I'm going to pick on you a little. I know you all like to enthusiastically participate in talks. Sometimes there's yelling. Please don't yell at me. So, <laughs> a background on me, I got my degree in electrical engineering last year. I've been an antenna design engineer in the aerospace industry for the last nine months, and I've had a ham license since 2015. A lot of hams have been practicing operating longer than I've been alive. You will never hear me on the radio because I don't like to talk to people at all, ever. I just think radios and RF and antennas are pretty cool, and hopefully you'll semi-agree with me by the end of the talk. So this talk is going to be divided into three sections, kind of an introduction to designing stuff, what you should look for if you're into designing your own antenna, or if you're looking to buy an antenna for a project, 
then I'll go into a couple different projects that I've done that might have interest to you. So what's an antenna anyway? And according to the IEEE standard definition of terms for antennas, because apparently that's a necessary document that exists, it's a means for radiating or receiving radio waves. Now, why did I start with a definition of something that a lot of people are familiar with other than a really cliched introduction? Because I like this definition for a couple reasons. I think a lot of people get really upset or get really into the details and lost in the weeds of antennas. What are they actually? What is, this is antenna. What is it right now? Nothing. This is a funnel right now because it's not connected to anything, right? I'm probably the only weirdo that thinks antennas just by themselves are kind of cool. They're a means to an end, right, ultimately. Like, you can like them, but they're a means to an end to fulfill the requirements of your system and to close the link. That's the point, right? So on the right, I'm an antenna design engineer, right? So for one of my senior design projects, I probably built like the best antenna my professor had ever seen. I kind of forgot about it until like the last couple of weeks. It was a six meter uh, receiver for an audio beacon. And I waited till the last minute as students and all of us are somewhat prone to do he said, Karen, what's your antenna? I was like, ah, I was going to get to it, I promise. He said, stick some alligator clip leads on the end. You'll be able to hear the transmitter that's in the room. Now, why do I tell you that? Other than to set your bar really low for this talk right at the beginning, it's to show you that, yes, antennas can be really complicated, right? If you want to get into the fields, Maxwell's equations of how they behave. But you can also have a lot of leeway in what will actually serve as an antenna sometimes. So this might not be that helpful if your hard designed antenna that you've spent hours on isn't working and you think, well, clip leads will work too. But just use this to not be that intimidated by the process. So what makes an antenna good? Um, and that can be a weird question to sometimes try to ask or to answer to someone that's maybe not familiar with antennas, right? And this is actually a huge part of my job in the last nine months, explaining to a mechanical engineer and a program manager with a mathematics background, well, what's a good antenna if we don't have a reference? You can get lost in a lot of things. And these are the requirements that I kind of start in with these aerospace engineering students when they first are looking at an antenna and they're freaking out and they say, I don't know what to do, I don't know what I'm looking for. First of all, frequency has to be the same as the frequency that you're interested in, right? Um, that's, that's number one, nothing, uh, and low noise amplifier isn't gonna change your frequency. I've had to have that talk a few times. So then you've got gain. And people get really obsessed about gain sometimes. They want like the highest gain antenna. They're like, oh, mine's the best. And if you're doing a contest that like microwave update, and you're going for the most gain, then yes. But otherwise, how much gain do you really need an antenna? You need it to fulfill the requirements of your system, and you need it to close the link. There are places in industry where the gain's not that much, and that's what they need for those application antennas. So some people get really obsessed about this number, and they want it the highest. You might not need that. Polarization. Polarization is just the orientation of the electric field vector, right? And we want it to match up because polarization loss is bad, right? And no one would ever recommend having a linearly polarized antenna receiving a circularly polarized signal, right? That's ridiculous. That's half your power gone, half. People have recommended that. And before, I know, you're, you kind of have that feeling in your gut of like half, half the signal gone. But if you don't need that 3 dB, then that can be okay. There was actually a guy that did a write-up of receiving NOAA weather satellite data with a linearly polarized antenna. It's actually a really cool little project because circularly polarized antennas can start, they can be a little more advanced if you haven't done them before, right? And so that would be a good introduction. And so you have to kind of overcome this, oh, I'm losing all this power. If you don't need it, then it's okay. You just need to close the link. Your pattern matters. 
a lot of students get really obsessed with gain in one direction. They think if I have to receive a rocket payload, I'm going to have a Yagi. It's going to have 20 elements, it's going to be 15 DBI gain, and I'm going to have a student and he's going to point it there the whole time. The student gets distracted and they go like this. And then they're like, oh, we can't find the payload because you had such a directional receiving antenna that as soon as someone gets distracted, you lost your signal, right? And so that's something to consider. Bandwidth, how wide a range do you want? It can be, the more bandwidth you need, the more difficult the antenna can be to design. An impedance match. Impedance match. That's rule number one, right? Other than the right frequency. Impedance match is everything. Who in here thinks you can have a good antenna with a visoir above, you know, two? No one? Visoir and impedance match is not everything. Now, sometimes people in the ham community, I've also seen this in academia, where like professors will get really obsessed with like, you want the perfect match, you want everything mathematically perfect. You can have a really great antenna that has a crappy impedance match, and it'll still work. And you can have an amazing impedance match on a dummy load that does absolutely nothing. So when you start accepting a higher impedance match, you'll start having ripples in your gain. If you don't need that much, or if that's not going to affect your system, you can tolerate it a little bit. Now you need to tune for a perfect impedance match, but this is one of those things. Will it close the link? Will it fulfill the requirements of your system? Sometimes you can get away with a little bit of a mismatch if you don't want to spend hours and hours tuning just for perfection. So who in here has an intuitive knowledge of how waves propagate through a waveguide? Okay. Um, when I was in school, I wanted to do a lot of antenna projects and I wanted to take classes and I was told, no, you don't have fields yet. You really need fields to build antennas, to design antennas. Well, I didn't want to do that, so I made them let me take the class at the same time as my fields class. And I didn't know anything. The professor was horrible, I didn't learn anything. So how did I start to learn how fields propagate with antennas, with waveguides? I started looking at tutorials for ANSYS HFSS. HFSS is High Fre Frequency Structure Simulator Software. It is one of the most expensive antenna design and modeling softwares on the market. It is also arguably one of the best, like a six-figure license. No one here can probably afford that or you would be doing better things than attending this talk. But if you can watch tutorials, not only are they designing antennas according to the software that you can steal and use on your own projects. When they run simulations, you can start to gain an understanding of what's going through your antenna. This is what helped me the most, is actually seeing fields propagate in real life. This is when I thought antennas were cool, is actually getting to see it with my own eyes. Because you can look at a lot of diagrams and there's a lot of math involved. I'm a visual learner. I really enjoyed getting to see it. And for some reason, no one had recommended trying to look at this. And there weren't a lot of other options for seeing this kind of thing. So these are some of the resources that I've used for design. The Antenna Theory book by Bolanis. Some people in the industry kind of disagree with his mathematics and the way he does equations. If you're just looking for like introductory you know, how do I look at bandwidth? How do I calculate half power beam width? Those are some things that can give a really good introduction. It is also one of the antenna design books that I was able to find as a PDF on the internet, because otherwise antenna design books are really, really expensive. The, ARRR, the ARRL antenna book is a really good starting point that I liked, especially it goes into Yagi's a lot if you're interested in doing a really directional gain antenna. It's 
huge, it's thick, it doesn't cover everything, but it'll get you a starting point to, I want to look this up more, so it'll at least give you a direction of what you need to look up to get further along on your design. The Radio Mobile Freeware, this was a really interesting software because, again, it was visual to me. It was a software that used GPS coordinates and could plot the needs from making it from one point to the other. And you could tell it what kind of antenna you had, what you thought your gain was, your polarization. It shows the Fresnel zones over your path. And that made a lot of sense to me because, again, I was a visual learner. And so that's something that can also get you looking into what you need to be looking at if you want to design an antenna for a system, what your needs uh, should be. So I wanted to do a quick overview of some design. I'm not walking you through pure design of one antenna. There's too many, and I didn't think I could find one that might appeal to one person or another. So now I'm just going to show you one project that I did when I was a senior in college. And so I found this resource by Antenna Test, Test Lab. And they're a really interesting company. They do uh, business card antennas um, and do like all kinds of different designs. Um, and they had an article about 3D printing your own antennas. And I thought that was like the coolest thing I'd ever seen. You know, it's 3D printing, it's an antenna, and they really do a great walkthrough of everything. But one of these things stood out to me that they said. When you 3D print an antenna, it's out of PLA, it's rough, right? So if you're operating at microwave frequencies, surface roughness becomes a thing that's going to lead to diffraction of your waves. Diffraction causes loss. You're not going to have a good, smooth, high gain curve, right? And they said they had to smooth the PLA, and then they applied a conductive metallic paint. The way they smoothed it, though, was this dichloromethane that is too poisonous to be put in paint thinner anymore. I thought, oh crap, that's bad, right? If they won't even put it in paint thinner anymore. And I have always been interested in space. And I knew that they had a 3D printer on the International Space Station, the ISS, and I knew they had just sent like another one up. And I was like, okay, they have a 3D printer on the ISS. I mean, you could 3D print an antenna, even like following this exact guide, except all this hazardous smoothing material and this, you know, toxic spray paint, how would they get around that? They, NASA is pretty known for wanting to mitigate risks with their astronauts. So I thought, what's the safest, cheapest, easiest, healthiest way that you could metalize an antenna? Going back, I stuck tape on it. That was my fancy solution. And one of the reasons why I deliberately chose a kind of ham-fisted solution was I wanted to see how much I could get away with without doing it the right way. If you are in the middle of nowhere and you just have to duct tape stuff together, would it work? So this is the model that I stole slash downloaded for free from Antenna Test Lab site. It was just a 15 dBi standard gain horn. I chose X-Band because the K-band they even talk about on the site, the resolution of the printer becomes a problem when you're dealing in that small of a wavelength. And then S-band for my 3D printer that I had, it was too big to be machined all in one piece. And I just used a 10% infill because I was a very cheap student and standard diamond pattern. Simulating it, I was able to have access to HFSS at the time. Here you can see how the waves are supposed to propagate through the horn. And look at that return loss plot. Now, there's a big swooping curve, right? Now let's look at the S11. So this is going to show the S11, or return loss. Remember S11, power applied to port 1, reflected off of port 1. So this is, you're losing it. The red solid line is the aluminum tape antenna that I did. The dotted black line is a copper tape model. And then the dashed blue line is just PLA with no metallization on it. So remember that HFSS model, that swooping curve? 
It looks a little bit like it in the aluminum, right? The PLA is all over the place, but we would expect that because it's just PLA. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting here at first and was even confused by was the better performance of aluminum tape, aluminum tape versus copper. Now, why was that? Let's look back at the photos. See how smooth that aluminum tape looks? Look at how chunky that copper tape is. That copper tape is one millimeter thick versus less than half a millimeter thick of the aluminum. It's what we had on hand. It wasn't something I, that I initially considered in the design. But look at how much it affected the performance. So that's something to consider if you're using tape to kind of hack together your designs. Smoothness and uh, keeping away from those edges that are going to diffract waves when you're at high frequencies can matter a little bit more than whether or not it's copper or aluminum. Next, looking at ST1, the power received at a second port that's transmitted from the first one. You can see the aluminum tape still outperforms the copper. It's the top line. The PLA is way down in the dirt, right? This is a, remember you have to use a far field equation. If you're doing an ST1 measurement, it has to be, you know, not in your near field to take that. Unfortunately, that's all the equipment that I had at the time. I wasn't able to take pattern measurements, but this was something that was at least a start in playing around with antennas in kind of a cheap way. They also have ways that you can 3D print Helix, helical models so that you can wind tape around them. And there's a few more people getting into this. There are dual extrusion printers. You could try layering. They have conductive PLA, but it's more expensive. And I keep telling myself that I'm going to do more with this project with all my free time that I have. And it's one of those things I think every ham has. It's you're always going to do like the next project, right? So the second project that I wanted to discuss that has more of an open source uh, angle to it was a hackathon at the SETI ATA, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Allen Telescope Array in Hack Creek, California. So one of the reasons I'm also bringing it up, this was done in May of last year. They're going to redo the hackathon. Probably in June, they're trying to work around, I think it's FOSDEM or a homogenous encryption or something hackathon that's going in the same area in May. So if you follow GNU Radio, especially on their social media, that's how I found out about it last year, and I would highly recommend. So this was a project with Breakthrough Listen, UC Berkeley SETI Research Center, and the SETI Institute. And they took people from RF professionals or RF unprofessionals like myself, they had machine learning experts and people from the GNU Radio open source community. For those that aren't familiar, GNU Radio is an open source software defined radio platform. It's very beginner friendly. Um, they have a lot of cool projects that you can do to get introduced to digital signal processing. And they're a really great community, very friendly, um, very, very knowledgeable. And so we were out there for three days and did a hackathon. So some of the different projects that we did, they wanted to detect and characterize some radio signals. Um, there was a group that did deep learning approaches from the Aerospace Corporation out there the whole time. There were people doing uh, data capture management and QA for the radio systems. Um, GNU radio people uh, using tools for real-time and offline processing. One of the coolest projects that someone did was they have Voyager 2, the spacecraft that was launched in 1977, data that you can play with. Like, it's openly available. You can use GNU radio and, like, run it through and look at processed spacecraft data, you know, from a spacecraft that was launched in the 70s. And I thought that was one of the coolest things. Um, and they even have, like, a pretty good tutorial on how to do it. There were people from SIGMS. I have no idea what they did. They used the word metadata a lot. Um, and then I worked on the highlighted portion, which was RF front end and antenna status and health management. That's, I'm an antenna person. I wanted to check on the health of my baby. Like, is it okay? Is it working properly? How do we decide 
if it's screwing up the rest of the system. So about the ATA, if you're unfamiliar, they have 42 dishes out there right now. They hope to grow to over 350. If you've heard of Jill Tarter, this was her big project. If you haven't heard of Jill Tarter, but you've seen the movie Contact, that character is based on her. Like that's based off a real person. That's who she is. Um, so it's been around since 2007. It is in the middle of nowhere. There were a ton of mosquitoes. It was, it was, that part was the worst. Everything else was great. So here's the feed of the antennas. This is one of the new style of feed. It's not a death ray, um, according, unlike one of the wired journalists that just wrote about it. So if you're an antenna person, you might already know it's a triangular pyramidal log periodic antenna, right? So they go over a huge band. So the new ones go um, to a little under a gig to 18 gigs. And that's the new style. The old style, they were only going from 500 megahertz to 11.2 um, gigs. They're actually running into the problem now where the antenna has such a broad range that they're at the limit of the low noise amplifiers that can match it. And that's unusual, right? Because normally your antenna can generally be your limiting factor when you're doing some of this stuff. But for once, I wasn't the bad guy. It was, um, they're struggling with the LNAs. So if you really want to make a lot of money, you should design a really broadband LNA and sell it to SETI. So what kind of issues did they have out there that we you know, were interested in maybe solving? And I was surprised at how similar these were to like ham radio or hobbyist issues. They had a lot of mechanical issues, like the cryo breaking down. I know most of us don't work with cryo systems, but the circuit boards and the soldering breaking off, right? That's a common issue for all of us. Um, having difficulties with the hot and cold loading out there and connector issues. How many of us in some of our projects with RF have had connector issues? It's like it's always the connector, right? And you would think even at my job as a professional, I would have thought they would have figured this out and not had connector issues. They are the bane of my existence. Um, so don't feel bad if you as a hobbyist or as a ham have that same issue. It's, it's for everyone. So on the Antenna Health Working Group, I was able to work with a lot of people much smarter than me. Uh, Michelle Thompson of Open Research Institute, uh, Derek's with GNU Radio, and he's a PhD student at Cardiff, and Katie Frey um, was one of the librarians from Harvard and the Smithsonian Library of Center for Astrophysics. So what did we actually do? What were we concerned about? We wanted to look at kind of a multi-sensor data fusion, and data fusion is always hard, right? We're taking all these inputs and we're trying to combine it in a way that makes sense, not only through code for a computer to read, but for a human being who is maybe not technically proficient to take a quick glance and say, what's wrong with the system? You know, do I need to get out of bed at one in the morning and go fix something, or is it okay? Uh, we also were able to help with a lot of data collection uh, code cleanup. Initially, we thought we were going to have to write all the code ourselves, but like 90% of problems in engineering, we just had to get two people to talk to each other because one had written a bunch of code but had not told the person right down the hall from them. So once we solved some communication issues, it was um, a lot easier to go forth. And writing some GNU radio processing blocks to try to use that base to help uh, the ATA with their processing. So here's an example of like one of the things we were concerned about, right? The cryo temp. And so one of the reasons that I really like this example is when you're looking at a temperature, you might have like a nominal range that you're interested in. Then there might be like slightly off nominal, higher, slightly off nominal, lower, and then there's red alert, something is very wrong or broken. I like that they went to zero Kelvin in their range even though that would you know, be physically impossible to have on this planet, but it was a possibility that they were prepared for. We're almost done. So here are some of the resources and links to everything I've had. Um, I do think that they're posting the slides, so you could always click the link or um, ask me for it and I can email it to you. 
The first link is that project I talked about with the guy using a linearly polarized antenna to receive circularly polarized signals. Um, so that was for NOAA weather satellite data. If you have any interest in like getting started, it was uh, not an overwhelmingly difficult project, so that would be something fun to do. The video that I showed uh, for looking at HFSS um, is the second link. One thing I will warn you, um, which this kind of goes for all RF, if you're looking at YouTube tutorials, they can be really hit or miss, right? I'll never forget being indescribably angry because someone on YouTube was talking about H-plane patterns and he said H and H-plane stood for horizontal and that is not correct and he had comments disabled on the YouTube video. So <laughs> maybe intentionally for that reason, but um, they're always with a grain of salt, right? Um, just as anything I say, I can be wrong with probably everything that I'm saying. Uh, the link to the radio mobile freeware, the antenna test lab, they have like a bunch of cool stuff that they do, but the 3D printing article uh, about the SETI, uh, ATA, Steve Croft uh, wrote a really good write-up of the hacking SETI uh, that we did, and especially if you have any interest in maybe participating in that, that would be a good article to read. And if you want to do a really, really technical deep dive into what the antennas of the ATA are comprised of, um, there's also a link to that paper that I got a lot of information from. And so I kind of waver between two things when I talk about antennas. One, we talk about their black magic, right? And that's even in the title of my talk. People say, oh, it's black magic, it's impossible. They can be hard. Um, there's also no shame in buying one. I know that might sound weird to hear from an antenna design engineer that's talking about design antennas, but I've seen people get really stressed out about, they're like, I'm going to design my own antenna, you know, you, you know, you're not a real engineer until you've, like, done this. I buy an antenna if you really want to. Like, it's fine. If I say it's fine and I don't shame you, no one else is allowed to say that it's not fine and shame you. Um, my boss is an amateur extra ham. He's been an RF engineer for forever, and he was just telling me about an antenna he bought. You know, so it's, they're fun to play with, but don't let anyone tell you that you absolutely have to design one or that you're not a real engineer if you don't. Connector is always the problem. Sometimes it's not the problem, but it's always the problem. Um, even professionals have to tune. That was one thing that I was really surprised by when I got my full-time job at an aerospace company that had um, a printing board house like in-house. They were like, oh yeah, we have to build extra material and then like tune away. I was like, really? Like even with all this fancy software, like you can't just get it right the first time? No. So don't, don't feel bad if you make an antenna and you have to tune it. That's Everyone has to tune. And they can be fun. I think they can be fun. So please have fun with them. And does anyone have any questions for me? Yes, sir. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the PLA printed antennas? Have you tried smoothing them without the tone? Did you design this one, or was it one that you downloaded? Did you just, or just designed an open cast? Sorry, that's my question. That's what I will try to answer all of them. Um, so, and I'll even go back to it. So the question was about the 3D printing project. So I did not design this. This is available already through Antenna Test Lab. I did not modify the design at all. It is available in both Google SketchUp uh, files and STL files. So you can go straight from downloading it as an STL, putting it to a 3D printer, and it goes. Um, I did not do any smoothing on these. I ran out of time on uh, the research project. What I would have liked to have done is doing mechanical smoothing first, even though they do discuss that they tried to do it and it was like useless. Um, and I would also be interested in seeing how much different smoothing techniques affected different frequency ranges, right? Like is it noticeable between S-band to all the way up to K-band. Um, did that answer all of your questions? Or might I might have missed one. Yeah. Okay. 
Yes, sir. Back in the day, um, so I got my ham radio license. The reason I got it, um, I did two tours as an analog astronaut at Mars Desert Research Station, which is in the middle of nowhere in Utah. So they have a lot of communication problems. So you have to use ham radio if you want to do any sort of, uh, you know, long range communications back to the main hab that people stay in. And originally I had submitted a different project. This was like my first year going back to school for engineering. Um, the project was rejected by the Mars Society, but I'd already gotten in. And my physics professor, famous last words, said, build a radio repeater, they're not that hard. I had no idea what I was doing. Like I shudder, I keep thinking one day I will have the resolve to look back at what I did and see how wrong it was, but I'm not there yet. Um, but that was, in the 400 megahertz range. Um, so not, I made like a quarter wave monopole with radials. It was horrible. Yeah. Um, it technically worked. I'm not really sure why or how. It was, it was really bad for my first project. Um, I've always been interested more in upper frequencies but that was my one experience. Yes, sir? Has anyone tried this with SLA printing instead of FDM? Not that I am aware of, but I might just not know. Any additional questions, comments, yelling? Okay. Well, that's all I have. Thank you for attending my talk. Very wonderful.
Test, test, test. It's working? Yep.
check, check. Can everybody hear me okay? I don't know. We might give it another 30 seconds or so. I know there's uh, several people, at least in the booth, Arden booth, that we're, we're going to come here, and they're not here yet. So uh, we'll give it maybe just a few seconds and then get going here. So let me ask a few questions before we get going. How many of you are hams in the group? Okay, so we got everybody, but maybe just one. I'm working on it. You're working on it. All right, all right. <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right. All right, so every so uh, that'll help me with some of the terms I use today. Um, if if I say something that doesn't make sense, be sure to to let me know, and I'll uh, I'll expand on a little bit. Um, so my name's Joe Ayers. I've been a ham since 1974 when I was first licensed as a kid uh, uh, with a novice license. Uh, I've been in uh, product development for most of my career with uh, hardware software products. Uh, so I uh, live and breathe in development environments uh, nowadays. I am one of the uh, main contributors for the firmware for the Arden software. So. At the birds of the feather, if you have any questions in more detail on the firmware or any of the open source and embedded Linux that's in there, I can go into uh, some detail on that if anyone's interested as well. So hang around for the, the three o'clock birds of a feather. Uh, that's an open discussion that we can, can go into more whatever detail we want to talk about at that time too. So in uh, today, in this presentation, the uh, been a, a big big discussion in in some of our community of what's happening with allocations. These are very very valuable allocations with uh, that we have and have been using uh, for a number of years. So let's let's you know before we dive into that, we need to just do a brief review of what are the allocations we have, and and we'll cover some of the basics of those allocations and they go into the specific of what the proposals are at the FCC and, and uh, what's on the table and, and uh, then we'll, we'll speculate a little bit about well, what, what might that mean for us and, and, go in, and then go into some of the, the hardware issues about how we can continue to adapt uh, commercially available hardware to continue to build high-speed data networks. So. In the three, five gig, even two gig, in the microwave range, our allocations for ham radio are considered secondary. Now, what, what does secondary mean? Uh, it means we're not going to cause any harm to the primary. It uh, means that we can't claim protection from interference from the primary. But, and most importantly for, for us, is other secondary or other uh, licensees in the space have to accept harmful interference from us. So that'll, uh, that, that rule is uh, important for us and we'll, we'll touch base on where that, that uh, you know, who we're competing with and who we have to be concerned about and who has to be concerned about us. So, sec so that's secondary, it's, you know, it's primary, secondary, and then additional secondary or other licensed rules uh, after that point in time for allocations. So the, the significant one for us is the unlicensed space where we overlap with, with Wi-Fi in everyone's home. Uh, that's, that's part 15 are the SC rules about that. And so they're considered, they're considered after our secondary or additional licensing in these frequency spaces. So, so when we're working at a tower site or working uh, wherever, part 15 device manufacturers have to consider that they will have to accept interference from radio stations broadcast amateur who are you know primary or secondary 
uh, allocations depending on, on what frequency space we're talking about. But of course, in, in two gig and five gig, uh, we are secondary. Part 15 does have to accept interference from amateur radio secondary licensing. So let's look at the actual allocation as it sets today. This is right off of the FCC's frequency allocation table. You can tell the primary allocation is capital letters. So radio location, and this is, we're looking at the three gig space for the ham radio allocations from 3.3 gig to 3.5 gig. Radio uh, location, well what is, what is that? What is the primary? Well that's military radar basically which is predominantly going to be used on coastal areas, you know, San Diego offshore here will have it. Uh, those, that's the primary, and we're uh, not able to cause interference to that primary. I don't think anyone that I uh, know about has ever had any situation here in prime area of military of any interference uh, that I've ever heard of. Has, has any of you heard of any of that in Southern California? It's uh, uh, this would be a prime area we would have it, but the, the significance is, is we don't today have to be too concerned about transmitting in a three gigahertz band. Uh, we don't really see competition with the primary. Uh, it's, it's wide open, it's, it's clear for us. So where's, where's the secondary? Well, it's uh, non-federal use uh, is amateur, that's us. And, and of course, more of radio location uh, for uh, uh, in, in non-federal use of, of the same as well. Uh, so you can see over here. Here's the follow-on allocations for uh, you know beyond the secondary part. Uh, there's no part 15 here. There's no unlicensed in this space today. And we don't see any uh, real competition with any land mobile. Uh, part 90 type devices, so we don't we don't see that. Three gigahertz for uh, using for Arden is a wide open space for us today. So let's look at five gig. Same thing, radio radio location. Uh, there's uh, Doppler radar in here now. So we're looking at. Uh, I'll show a frequency table so we can kind of map it up to channels here in a minute. Uh, we're looking at 5650, 5830, uh, uh, all the way up to 5925 through the amateur allocations. So, so this is the, the 5 gigahertz area of concern for the amateur allocations. So, so here's where we are competing up with part 15 devices that have to accept interference from us. Here is, uh, in this higher area, is uh, some fixed satellite, mobile, uh, primary and, and then amateur, we're not, uh, you know, we're not really seeing any competition today with any of these. Uh, ISM equipment, we're not competing with those, you know, could be a microwave type toaster device, they're not telecommunication devices, uh, or land mobile or some of the personal radios, we're not seeing any competition with those, those today. So let's look at it, take a step back and kind of map that up to all the channels and, and where we're at today. So this is the unlicensed space. If you, you go into a home access point, you'll, you'll see some of the, these lower channels down here. Uh, the Uni 1, 2, and 3, uh, that's unlicensed national infrastructure, that's what that stands for. And these are different, you know, the different allocations for different power requirements and purposes for use of unlicensed. So uh, we can see up here in the five gigahertz range where the ham allocation is, uh, we're going from overlapping with the unlicensed starting around channel 132. Now these are center frequencies. You'd you would actually have to be above that so that you didn't have emissions below the, the band edge, uh, but that goes all the way up to the band edge of channel center 185. Now originally there was a, a, 
an unlicensed 15.247, that was before 802.11 protocols came out. It was for, as they were starting up with spread spectrum technologies and, and was allocated. And then eventually that became a, a, a Uni3. Now that allocation is typically used by wireless ISPs. Probably in a lot of access points, you're not gonna see channels up in that area as as selections, they're they're going to be you know they're going to be 2C or or one or 2A uh, al allocations that you might see in a typical home access point. But you go to a tower site with a wireless ISP, you're going to see channels going all the way up nowadays to 169 with a 10 megahertz bandwidth that stays within that that frequency allocation. I just ran into that two weeks ago installing some equipment down in San Juan Capistrano. The city has up a brand new ubiquity device and it was running 169 at 10 megahertz for sure, right, right at the edge of that unlicensed allocation. So we start to see those. Um, there was a 25 megahertz slot at the top of this that only was converted to unlicensed about four years ago. It, uh, Uni3 uh, uh, fell short of that mark by about 25 megahertz until about four years ago. And, and so a lot of devices out there, the Air Max series used by Arden, the Aero and OS and those were designed before that time, so they only go up to like 165 at, at the top. So you may run into Air OS and other devices that only go to 165. It's because they didn't expand it all the way to, uh, up to channel 170 until about three or four years ago. So three gig, here's our allocation here from 0.3 up to 3.5. And in the Arden devices, the support is from about 3370 up to 3.5. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more, I'll blow up on that and we'll talk about why that is the case uh, here in another slide in a little bit. But we, you know, we noticed that if you took a five gig, subtracted two gigahertz, then you get into this range here that there's, there's some uh, very easy uh, two gig um, uh, trans, uh, transducers to get down to that frequency range. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. So what, what does this proposed rulemaking say? For the three gig, it basically says, let's clear the band. Reallocate amateur radio to some unspecified location. Interesting. Seek comments on what that location might be. Maybe it's 3.1 to 3.3. And then prepare it for future use. Really interesting NPR. They're 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 trying to uh, an NP, you know notice for proposed m rulemaking. They're 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 clearing it, and they're not actually saying what they're going to do with it yet. Interesting. So we'll, we'll, we'll get, let me get to that. Let's talk about the, the, the uh, so let's talk about the five gig NPR. What does it say? It, it doesn't say anything about ham radio in our secondary allocation, right? It, it's not proposing to change that. We still have rights and, sh and we're still sharing it. So the space of concern, and let me, let me float back up to the bigger screen. What we're talking about is this space right here. From 5.85 to 5.925, channel 170 to 185. That's where we have clear sailing today to use to build networks in you know, highly densely populated Southern California and other areas like that. That's the, that's the space this proposed rulemaking is talking about for five gigahertz. And today, it actually has an assignment. It has a primary assignment for transportation usage. They have, have it all fully defined uh, with, with these channels going up through you know, 184 up to the band edge. 
and to be used for uh, you know, intelligent transportation systems, uh, safety systems for cars. This is uh, uh, cars making ad hoc communications with other cars, with bridges, with, with other safety issues within the transportation structure, with uh, you know, navigation, with all kinds of features that is now building this network at, you know, across the cars. And, and it was all, it's, it's already been assigned, and we've been uh, coexisting uh, with them. But unfortunately, well, for us, they, they, or good for us, they haven't used it, right? It's been clear for us. But unfortunately, because they haven't used it, the FCC is going to take it away. That's what they're doing. So if we look at it, in that uh, allocation of 75 megahertz, they're saying, all right, we're going to give 45 megahertz of that to the unlicensed space for unlicensed use, 802.11 protocols. And we're going to keep 30 mega megahertz. That's, they've, they've had 75. Now you can have 30 megahertz. But let's get comments. Are we going to have it with the manufacturers that want to do 5G protocols? Or and we're going to share it with other manufacturers that want to do 802.11 protocols? Or should we just do all 5G protocols on, on that whole space allocation? So, so the, the different manufacturers of cars are in two camps right now with, with two different protocols. Is it the cell protocol we're going to use, or is it the Wi-Fi type protocols that we're going to use? And, and so they're... Uh, uh, basically lost allocation because they haven't used it for many years today, which was good for us. So to extend the unlicensed spectrum, what does that do, right? So this, they, they used to call this, they were going to call that the Uni4 for, for what it was. Uh, unlicensed, but it's really now this is being extended to uni, you know, uni three licensing, which is the uh, rules and power requirements that WISP operators would use at tower sites. And we can see here that now they can have a 160 megahertz channel. Now there's enough bandwidth to add one more 160 megahertz channel. Now that channel is only provided with the latest 802.11 AC modes. You can have a 160 megahertz channel with, with 802.11 AC, not with N. And so it, it fits nicely, and that's one of the reasons why they want to take it up to 5895 is to have more of those those 160 megahertz channels that would typically be used in your home. Uh, a wireless ISP is not going to use 160 megahertz bandwidth because the power limitation won't allow them to go very far at all spreading the energy across the 160 megahertz. Tower sites are going to be using less than 20 megahertz typically. If you look at AeroS and Ubiquity, you'll find that the, band, the channel width selections, they go at a lot of different intervals, you know, seven and a half or 10 megahertz or uh, 12 and a half, you know, down in that range for their channel options. So there'll be a, a specific channel width that is optimal for the long, di long, the distance that you happen to be going, just the way the timing and everything works, um, that, that channel width there will be one that's that's optimal for a particular distance. So so this is what the proposal is saying when it extends the unlicensed up, and then it it leaves the uh, 30 megahertz on the end for the transportation groups. All right. Well, so what does that mean to us? Let's. Uh, Let's speculate here a little bit. Now, now some of the information that I have here, I've, I've learned and has come from uh, in a conference call I had with the lawyer that's representing the ARRL 
uh, and wrote the comments representing the ham community to the FCC. And he was a career FCC uh, employee uh, that, that knows the environment quite well. So, so one of the things he, he was telling us is that with this election cycle, there's a big push to complete rulemaking if there's going to be a change of leadership of the FCC. We want to complete rules, get them in the cycle uh, to, to have that badge of, of what got completed in, in a tenure. So it's going to go quickly is, is what the indication is. Uh, if in uh, wanting to happen by, by the end of this year to, to turn it into a rule. The, you know, today we do not have primary allocations. We can't expect that we would get a primary allocation for amateur radio. And that, that feeds in because the commercial momentum is massive, right? This is the, the, the need for this space, the commercial devices and, and everything everywhere from your toaster to, to your car uh, wants frequency space to do this. <laughs> well, I, I might, might have my, my toast, you know, I might want to have my toast, you know, pop up in the morning and me alerted it's ready, right? <laughs> so, you know, we, we really should expect to share frequency. We've been sharing it. It's something we've done for uh, all, all along. So we should expect that we're going to be sharing frequency. Um, now, 5 gigahertz was already used for transportation. That's good. They're, you know, they're not at tower sites. Uh, they're going to be down at road levels. They're going to have a little bit you know, lower power requirements. But we're not going to be competing with them at, at our tower sites or cell coverage sites. And uh, it, it's only down at the you know, street level that, that we're going to have some, some lower noise in power that, than what we'll be using. So the question was, well, when a car or an intelligent vehicle needs tower access, will that interfere with us? Well, they already have established you know, cell data networks that are not in these frequency allocations that they would be using for that purpose. So even today, with what is it, OnStars, you know, some, of the, some of the services that the car companies provide, they're all through cell, cell data. So we're not competing with those, so we'll be, we should be okay in that regard. This, this is, you know, uh, vehicle safety and, and vehicles communicating to one another. There, in some of the rules that I've read, there's, there's even limits on how high off the road an antenna can be, uh, lower power requirements of, of what they're doing. So uh, it's, we haven't seen any competition or uh, issues of interference to date, but of course there hasn't been a lot of, per, you know, it's not pervasive out there yet, so. I was going to comment on that the, if the cars need tower sites, it's probably easier for them to piggyback off uh, of cellular networks rather than yeah. building an entire national infrastructure yeah. for it. Yeah. So also with 5G type stuff, um, hey, we're going to use... Yeah, it's, there's an existing infrastructure for them to, to do that. Uh, get into servers and other, you know, smart applications. Uh, they don't need to rebuild that with this frequency space, and we're not competing with it. So, it, it, so it's good they're not at tower sites. Uh, five gigahertz going to licensed for uh, Part 15 or Wi-Fi, you know, it is bad. They are at tower sites, and, and uh, we know today that if you're at a commercial tower site for you to lock in that you're going to use a particular frequency, uh, you will have to pay a premium price competitive with what a commercial vendor m may be paying. Uh, I'm, I'm at a ta major tower site. Uh, I'm, I don't pay premium pricing if, if a c commercial uh, entity came in and said, I wanted that space on the tower, I would have to move unless I'm willing to pay the same rates as, as a commercial uh, entity is. Um, so uh, it, is, it is 
going to be challenging at, at tower sites to uh, be competitive to, to use this, uh, any of the overlap frequencies. So, but the other, on the other hand, sharing the space means that there's going to be a lot of devices out there that can be at low cost that we can repurpose and, and use uh, for, for our needs as well and customize capability and functionality as we're doing today. Now, the FCC, when we looked at the three gigahertz proposed for rulemaking, they were just looking to clear it. They, they didn't think that anybody was using it. They didn't know. Uh, in fact, uh, what, what we learned is, is that in, you know, years ago, for years and years and years, hams worked for the FCC, were, were part of the process and rulemaking process, and had knowledge that could feed into it to do that. Today, there are no hams in the process working at the FCC. Well, we, we could speculate. Uh, uh, it, it may just be because if you look at the typical, you know, what, what's the average age of a ham radio operator today? We're retired, right? So we're, you know, we're in the age of the Internet, and our challenge and what Arden is, you know, doing is you know marrying internet age technology and, and interest with with ham radio, so, so uh, this is a kind of technology that we're bringing more in, but we need to do more, and and then some of those individuals will go in and work for the FCC maybe maybe one day. So so they the FCC didn't know that anybody was using it. They thought they'd just clear it and make it ready. So all of the comments, maybe some of you have posted comments uh, to, to this, they're learning. We've had a lot of cities post comments that, that they're using it. And, and if you read through those, you, you can go to the FCC website and read through everyone's comments. And if you look at the ARL's response, basically they're saying, the, the rulemaking gave no reason why amateur radio um, needed to be relocation, relocated. We share today as secondary. We should continue to share all of this frequency allocation in moving forward. And, and so that's, you know, that's, that's what we, we want. We, we don't want our allocation to change. And so there's a reasonable chance that it won't change because now the FCC is aware that we are using it. Uh, the jury's out. We'll we'll still have to wait for uh, for the next steps to see what happens. But we we can have you know we should have uh, you know a positive outlook that they will keep it uh, as we are in the five gig. There's no reason or any other argument that says we shouldn't keep it in the three gig. Just the same. We do, yeah. So the question is, are there other emergency agencies that are um, uh, commenting on this? I've not seen any comments from those kind of agencies. Uh, you know, a Red Cross or, or even like the Orange County Sheriff or you know, fire. Today, what they're using is a commercial solution from Verizon or AT&T that gives them a quality of service in the infrastructure for uh, these kinds of situations, you know, for an, an incident or a disaster scenario. So they're, they're buying, and I, I saw the Orange County Sheriff, they, they rolled it out. Um, it's, it's a little, you know, cell data, with, you know, looks like an access point with antennas on it, and it gives them a data source through the cell tower that has quality of service. Uh, it was some, it's something new that they had, Three years ago, they tried to get data service through through Verizon at a community event, and the community event was so saturated they couldn't get data service as just any other user of it. 
now they can. And so those entities are all going to these types of commercial uh, applications that are generally 5G based in, in cell data networks. Um, or they're doing satellite like um, uh, the Red Cross will bring out their, their satellite uplink and they've got some uh, ability to get data back to their, uh, their uh, data centers. So, so the question is, is you know, what are commercial entities doing? Like, you know, Cisco was an example, or you know, other commercial entities for for their disaster communication plans. And so, uh, you know, all all the commercial entities uh, are 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 using all of the commercial data vendors for communication plans. So, you know, they're going to go to Ver Verizon or a satellite you know, company that provides those services. We know Elon Musk is launching satellites, you know, 60 at a time to provide broadband services of some of which some of that will be emergency. So, so all the commercial entities are going to go to the same source, all of the commercial vendors providing those data services, whether they're satellite or cell data gener generally. Right. Right. In, in, Cisco, in Cisco's cases, uh, you know, you'll be creating the equipment that augments providing the data to the different agencies. Right. So, uh, where where when you look at Arden or Ham Radio, you're you're likely not to see a city or a Red Cross or a hospital actually have ham radio in their business continuity plan or disaster recovery plan right they're they're going to have the uh, you know the commercial services in those plans for for the, the their dr situations uh, now some might um, i haven't heard of any yet but uh, keith question That, that's excellent. So the comment was that there's some uh, CMS med medical uh, medical services that are starting to write in other sources uh, uh, like amateur radio into their uh, disaster recovery plan. You know, it's, it's it's there's an issue now because emergency services is becoming commercialized, professionalized. And if, if you don't have an MOU or, you know, under the ICS, uh, you know, incident command system, if you don't have an MOU or prearranged agreement, you can't bring someone in to help support the incident. And, and so uh, we, we need to get to the place where we are written into the agreements so that entities will bring in amateur radio. Otherwise, they can't. It's no, their plan says we can't do that. Uh, so, all, you know, that in time, I think with the ICS and with all these systems, working with, you know, from the amateur radio community, reaching out to get ourselves in those agreements uh, will get us involved. Otherwise, we can't. You, you can't just show up under the ICS system. So. Uh, so, so the FCC is learning uh, that there is non-trivial use for Arden, and that uh, that means motivation to continue to share this space in, in 3 gig. Uh, I think that's a reasonable outcome uh, that that we can expect because it's very it's consistent with what's happening with with 5 gig, which which says we're not going to change anything with it. The, the only difference is, is already allocates Part 15 in some of these other uh, vehicle systems. Uh, 
Three gigahertz going to shared use? Yeah, it's it's bad. We're it, it means we're, we're gonna we don't share it really with anyone today. Uh, but it's uh, it, with that going back up to you know the commercial demand is is just so massive. We we should expect that we're gonna gonna share it. And that's what it means. A lot lot more noise. Th uh, three gigahertz going to shared use? Well. Uh, Good amateur allocations have priority staying with if we stay with secondary allocations, right? So, so it means that all the with the NPR in, in notice for pros rulemaking, it's saying that it will likely say that devices in three gig will still follow Part 15, which means they have to accept interference from us. Um, it does say in the 5 gigahertz proposed rulemaking that it will follow Part 15 rules and have to interfere, uh, accept interference from amateur radio. Uh, Was there a lot of food cries from the community when this proposed initially, or is it basically the ARL who said, well, we're going to fight this? I think it was a combination. Um, We've we've all been concerned about it. I think for some. Of this. So so the question was was you know is was it just the ARL or was it just the community that has raised concern about this? And I think everyone has, and we've all been concerned about it for a number of years, knowing uh, there's been a number of you know even in five gig, it's already been allocated to other other uses that are of concern to us. They just never used it. And that this would it could happen. Uh, there are proposed rulemaking. You know, basically most of the microwave band going up through six and seven gigahertz to to turn all the digital communications into uh, 802.11 protocols that are have proven to be very very efficient with OFDM. You know, having a license out there for somebody that's doing a T1 microwave. <laughs> It is is horribly inefficient use of the bandwidth, <laughs> just horrible, right? There should be no none of that you know old licensing existing anymore, all of it converted to you know highly efficient protocols that benefits us and everyone. Uh, so so let's look at you know you know what what kind of hardware are we using and do we need to continue to to uh, deliver broadband services uh, in the ham radio channels. So if we look at the ubiquity 3 gigahertz equipment that exists today, that device, you, you don't see an Athros 802.11 chipset that's a 3 gigahertz chipset. Uh, what you do see is chipsets that are 2 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz per the 802.11 specifications. Right? There is no 802.11 specifications for 3 gigahertz. So, so how do you get a 3 gigahertz 802.11 device? Well, you, you take a 5 gig, 5 gig device, and if you look inside the 3 gig rocket from Ubiquity, there's a minus 2 gigahertz down converter. And then you get you know, some coverage in, in ham radio, and we've this is the coverage we get out of all of our our allocations. So, so th we can either you know work with the internal converters that are that are out there to do this, or we can add our own transducers to up convert or down convert to get to the right uh, frequencies that we're trying to get to. So if you look here. If, if, let's say, we did end up with a 3.1 to 3.3 uh, allocation, we could take a ubiquity 5 gig, and we could get it at least down to 3.15 if we added our own down converter to it. We could do that. It now increases our cost to do that. It's, it's not as easy to just go buy it on Amazon, flash the firmware, and put it up on the roof. Uh, uh, now, now we'll have some, some more uh, project uh, kits to, 
to have fun with and some you know we might like that too <laughs> but it'll be a little you know another step in the process if we do our own down, uh, down converter on it uh, with with a three gig that's done internally uh, well let me let me come back to that if we look at the five gig radios so here's a typical coverage uh, this, this is a ubiquity device they'll go from 5150 up to 5875 per the manufacturer's specifications now now will they go above above that below it maybe it depends on how tight their hardware filters are um, it, it, it might actually go down to 5.1 uh, with, with, with minimal or negligible power loss of, of the signal uh, it might you know, today we're running. You know, we're going up to uh, five nine two five channel 184. We're doing that on a device. We're doing that 50 megahertz higher than what the what that manufacturer specification says it can do. Well, this is such a broad range of frequencies that the the hardware filter. Uh, to get that broad range probably isn't so tight on the end and that's why we're able to go up to 5925 today as we we change the firmware the chip will do it no problem but you know does all the downstream hardware filtering allow that frequency is the issue so uh, uh, so so we are you know we are getting 50 megahertz above the manufacturer spec on on rocket M5s or ubiquity and microtech devices today. So so here's a really interesting um, so this is this is a rocket M3 ubiquity device. And we've and we've pulled the RF shielding plate. This is a a, a broken uh, device that, that failed, had a hardware failure somewhere, pulled the plate off of it, and these are, uh, these are all filters. And so we popped this filter on the end of it out. This was done by uh, Ken, KE2N, and he, uh, he popped it out, and you can see it up here, it's popped out there. And then he put his signal generator on it and just started, you know, going up, stepped up in frequency and measuring the output power of it. And this is the profile that he came up with as to what this filter on the very end of this three gig device allows. So, so let me let me just explain this real quick for the non double E types here. Um, what this is saying is if I transmit a 3.4 gigahertz signal, the output power, so let's say from that point is that. If I transmit a 3.2 gigahertz signal, the output power is attenuated um, 20 some dB. Now let's put that into perspective. If I attenuated uh, 30 dB, I've attenuated it by a factor of 1,000. Right. So if I if I was putting out one one watt right here, and I went down 30 dB, you know, to here that would be one milliwatt by a thousand. So, so what does that mean? Well, if I'm, if I'm putting out less than a watt to begin with, I, the signal that I'm putting out over here in this frequen re frequency range is going to be almost nothing, if, you know, a thousandth of the power, right? So, so Arden is supporting 3.37 about right here so 
if you use a, a 3 gig in Arden today, I recommend you stay on 3.4 and above because you're you're going to get a little bit less power, but but we couldn't support frequencies lower than that because it's just not putting enough enough power to to make a connection to anything. But the but the the significance of this is is that these devices come with hardware filters that chop off the at the edge of their supported frequencies. And and we can only go so far out of them. So if let's say we got an allocation, you know, today we end at 3.5. Let's say they gave us an allocation between 3.6 and 3.8. That's trivial. Now I can use it in the uh, without doing any hardware modifications. I can just change the firmware and there's no hardware filtering that's, that's going to uh, going to block the signal and it'll it'll work. We might we might get into some SWR issues with you know d just as we're going pushing outside of the filter we are likely also pushing outside of the SWR how well that antenna matches the transmitter and how effectively it will transmit the signal. Uh, so, so we could run into some losses with SWR as well that we'd have to look at, right? Software, <coughs> as long as your hardware chip filter supports that range, <coughs> you use the software then to limit it down, even though our filter is down even more. Yeah, exactly. So, so. You can't go the other direction. We, yeah, we we would have to make changes to the hardware to go out of that for, you know between about 3375 and you know past 3.8 we would have to do hardware modifications to to have a device we can effectively use yeah we haven't we haven't run in this plot on the 5 gigahertz you know cuz we're we're 50 megahertz higher than the specs and it's working, right? It, it's, there's probably some drop off of power at those higher channels uh, because it's going pushing outside of the filter range of what the device's specs are. So um, it would be good if we could do a plot of the, uh, the uh, devices we're using and their hardware filters, you know, and pull that, that filter out at the, the very end. So, so the summary of this slide is is for us to use this low cost equipment, we need them to be pretty close into their specifications of where they operate today, keeping in mind they're covering the whole world allocations, not just the u s typically right when When you see a device and it says u s a or international. That's not a hardware thing. That's a firmware thing, right? They're they're going to build one piece of hardware that supports the world, and then they're going to lock it down to the region or location in firmware. So, what else can we do? Well, if you look at the Part 15 specifications for Uni3 for tower operators, if they use, for example, one of the big, the big rocket dish 34 dB I gain, you know, this is their biggest rocket dish antennas, we only usually get 30 dB gains for most things. I don't know if anyone's actually gotten the 34. But with a rocket matched with that very high gain antenna, a unlicensed tower site operator can't use the full power of the rocket through that antenna because he'll exceed the licensing that he has. You, he'll have to dial down the, pa the, the transmitter power to stay within his licensing. And, and that might be something like 15 or 17 dB instead of 25 dB, right? In, in other words, we can get above just with the commercial equipment as it is, what the unlicensed uh, operators can do that have to stay within Part 15. 
And, and if you look at that, I, I, I didn't do like antenna line loss and some other things that I've accounted for here. So, so the, the, the power is going to be some, somewhat a little bit less than that, but we're, you know, we're talking three inch antenna lines here, minimal loss. Um, effective uh, EIRP, radiated power. So that's a measure that says that the energy coming out of this dish would be as if I had uh, an isotropic radi you know, a ball of energy that was putting out 794 watts going out in every direction, is what that says. Now, you know, that, that's microwave kind of power. Don't, don't stand in front of these things, <laughs> please. <laughs> but, but the point is we can, we can use, uh, without modifications, you can even find higher gain antennas probably than that and put these devices on them and put out a whole lot more power than what an unlicensed WISP operator could do. So you can get above their noise. More cost. Uh, also, we can add power amps. You know, the ATV guys for years have been putting out a lot more power uh, than what, what these devices do. Now, more cost, of course, but we can do it. Uh, with OFDM, which is the 802.11N and AC specifications, Part 97 ham radio says we can do 1,500 watts peak to peak. That's transmitter power. That doesn't even include the antenna gain. We'll fry some birds, right? <laughs> but keeping in mind, there's also some Part 97 rules that say, you know, the minimum power you need to, you know, do communications as well. You don't, I mean, you know, nobody's going to be putting out 1,500 watts peak to peak in microwave. <laughs> you might not be able to afford the... Uh, the power amp, but uh, yeah, <laughs> but we can do it, right? We can go get some power amps, and and we can we you know just uh, two or three watts of of transmitter power uh, up above will will do the trick. Um, first presence if, in in many sites, if we've already established a presence at the site, then it then it's you know a beachhead we've established it. Then it's harder for a, in the future when there may be licensing for the WISP operator to come in and and take it over if you've had it established for a number of years. So anyone that has access to or contemplating putting up. Uh, 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 Arden nodes in these bands should go do it to to preserve it uh, to establish uh, precedence with it. Now, specific, uh, particularly if and this is I, this may not be well known, if you have a site in a national forest, you can register your transmitter and frequency with the national forest, and they'll prevent anyone else from from using it you can go through them and they're not the FCC they're you know they're not they're not the tower owner that's you know you're working with but they're um, you know they own that physical area if there's a tower site uh, within the within a national forest we've run into that at uh, Elsinore Peak uh, the owner there is has lease from the national forest we had a, a visit from the National Forest once just coming through to check all of our licensing and everything, and, and they do that, and, and uh, you can lock in with them that you're the only one in that area that can use that frequency. Uh, so then the tower owners and the WISP operators can't do anything about it. You, you're not going through the site owner to use the frequency. You're going to another <laughs> bureaucracy of the the, the national government to help you do that. So, so be sure if anyone you know has any towers anywhere in the national forest, that's where we can lock in things. Question? It's a different agency, <laughs> right? They, they, the national forest can control what happens in their territory. <laughs> Well, you have to, you, you, you know, the National Forest will have to 
register and approve that you can do that, right? They're, you know, they're going to have tower sites that they have zoned in the national forest. So, so at Elsinore Peak above Temecula, that's in the national forest. At Pleasant Peak, where I'm at, which is surrounded by national forest, it's private land. So it's not it's it's uh, not managed by the national forest. So uh, so if you're in national forest where you have rights from the national forest and the tower sites uh, authorized, um, you know they're managing what you're doing there. Then then you can now register your frequency with them. So at Elsinore we could register it. At Pleasant Peak we can't because it's private land surrounded by national forest. So, so little little things like that may not be well known, but but that you know, if you can get into the three or five gigahertz register with the national forest, then you've got it locked in at at that site, regardless of what the owner of the tower site or WISP operator might say. Okay, I just had a filler slide here. We're running out of time, but just to remind everyone what an OFDM signal is, um, it's made up of all, you know, 64 carrier waves. If I looked at a carrier wave on this frequency, its frequency spectrum would have lobes over, you know, going out like that at the higher and lower frequencies. The O in OFDM is orthogonal, and what does that mean? It means it's uncorrelated or that it doesn't interfere with the next carrier wave. So see where the null point is between these primary and you know trailing off lobes? The, the null point is right at the center of the next carrier. That's what it means to be orthogonal uh, or, or uncorrelated signals. So, so that means um, you know, every one of these is the spaced and the timing of the symbols uh, then, then allow these carrier waves so that they don't interfere with one another to be very, very close together. And then, then over time, I transmit the carrier wave and it's, you know, some phase or amplitude that's carrying a symbol and the symbol could be two bits or four bits or eight bits and and I transmit it for that symbol for that length of time. Then I have a little guard interval and I transmit another set of symbols and we've got 64 carrier waves. So in a 10 meg, you know, no matter if I'm on 10 megahertz, 20 megahertz, five megahertz, it's still 64 carrier waves. They're, you're squ they're squunched into that channel. And then the timing is I take, if I go from 20 to 10, the timing will double. It has to double to keep this orthogonality, to, ke to keep that signal OFDM, right? So, so while I may have 64 carrier waves that they're now taking up half the, f the frequency space, they're now taking up twice the time. So things like, you know, power per symbol or, uh, uh, is still the same regardless of channel and, and timing. But, but that's, that's what OFDM is. Um, some, of the, some of the exam questions that got put out in the last round of exam changes thought that Arden and 80211 technology was spread spectrum, which has a limit in power. It can't go to 1500 watts peak to peak. And so there were some questions out there in the pool that, that have said that. I'm not sure if they've corrected that yet, but um, only the old spec of 802.11g that nobody's using anymore had some modes of spread spectrum that would have those power limits. For, for us, 802.11n that we're only doing in, in Arden uh, and AC nowadays that everybody's moved to, it's OFDM. It's not, that's a, you know, it's like the difference, you know, AM modulation and FM are just two different techniques. Well, spread spectrum and OFDM are two different techniques, just the same. So, so all of the signals we're talking about, that's, that's what it looks like. That's what the O in OFDM means for orthogonality. 
Okay, we've run we've run out of time. Uh, just had several slides here of, the, of, of photos and whatnot. If you haven't seen them, but if if anybody has any questions, we've got uh, we've we've run out of time uh, for for the hour. But we have a birds of a feather in 30 minutes, and it's open dialogue, and we can have lots of discussions, whatever we want. Any quick ones? Um, I'm. I believe this is supposed to be recorded and will be posted YouTube or somewhere. Uh, check the conference schedules. I know they did last year, so I would expect it to be recorded and available online today as well. Uh, and I'll likely post it to the Arden website presentations or something. All right, qu last question. Yeah. Yeah. So new device support. Yeah. Um, let's talk about that in the birds of a feather, and and we'll, we can get some detail in that. And and it's in 30 minutes at three o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, take a break, grab a snack, and we'll we'll kick off with uh, some some open discussions. Hmm.